Welcome back to uh, Access Medic Presents. Uh, today is going to be the first episode of Offshore Medic Talk. And today we have got the uh, renowned TikTokers, Shade Tree Cardiology and the uh, Remote Medic. So uh, we're going to be talking about um, what we do offshore. So we got people in the chat section. Um, how do we want to start? How we started offshore or what do y'all want to do? Actually, I, I think I, I think the best thing to do is we'll go around and uh, y'all kind of introduce yourselves and what you do and a um, little bit of your history, if y'all are cool with that. Who goes first? Uh, okay. So uh, I'll start it off. Um, I've started uh, in EMS in 2005. I... Uh, was an EMT, got my medic in 10, uh, came offshore in what, 19, 20, nothing. I don't know. And, uh, been doing it ever since it's been fantastic. Um, working on expanding my, uh, licensures and being a better provider for my guys offshore. So next. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, go ahead, go ahead, remote medic. I, I want to be the last guy. Yeah, so I'm the remote medic uh, on TikTok. So I started off in EMS as 18 year old kid right after Hurricane Katrina in South Mississippi. There wasn't shit else to do. Uh, and the fire department was going to let me go hang out and do cool stuff. Um, we had a really involved EMR first responder program at the time. Uh, so I Right at 18 years old, I got my EMR, went on to EMT school right away. Uh, rode the ambulance as an EMT for six years. Went to paramedic school. Failed out of paramedic, failed slash got kicked out of paramedic school. Um, went back the next year, finished up. Worked the ambulance as a, as a street paramedic. Went into education, taught ACLS uh, for a couple of years. And then ended up on a sprint truck where I did uh, resuscitative medicine, respond to high priority calls, and then uh, hopped on as a supervisor. Did that for about three years. Did the offshore medicine thing. I was a drill ship medic. Uh, spent my time all around the Gulf of Mexico. And then uh, about two years ago, I got the chance to go into administration. And uh, I'm now the director of a U.S. North America offshore medical provider. Nice, awesome, very so, nice. Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that's a good one. So, uh, for everybody knows a uh, little bit about me. So, I, I started at uh, 18 years old. Um, well, I watched 9/11 happen on television when I was in the 11th grade. Um, joined the service uh, as a medic. Still don't know why. Nobody in my family is medical. Um, it just seemed like a thing to do. And uh, it was the first thing I had ever loved that much that I was also good at. Um, I'm not saying it came easy. It was just that the work ethic was was 100 percent there. Um, and I just wanted wanted to be good at it. And uh, I did eight years with the service where I functioned toward the end, almost autonomously. A couple of combat deployments, all that good stuff, the, the good stuff everybody does. And um, I got out and was going to go pretty much straight to undergrad and med school was the, the plan. And I uh, became a paramedic to have a good job with good benefits while I was going to undergraduate. Um, I had never counted on loving it that much. I had, I had no idea I was going to enjoy it that much. I uh, did 10 years with 911, um, started teaching fairly quickly because I was a teacher when I was in the service. Um, did, you know, the associate's degree and have completed all of my bachelor studies except for one management class. I need to go and do that. Um, and it's available this fall. I've talked to Western to just finish that out. 
and uh, worked, you know, a bunch of different stuff, kind of like everybody else, hospital-based, primary care, urgent care, um, all, all that good stuff. And then um, was in the middle of a hospital at home job, which ended abruptly. And uh, by that point, I had accidentally, um, I guess the word has gotten famous on TikTok and uh, just kind of threw a video out there saying, hey, I, I would like to work in something where I'm used to the the fullest capability that I'm available. I'd like for there to be a little adventure with it. And um, very lucky, the remote medic, who now that you know he's the he's the director, he contacted me and said, have you ever thought about offshore? And uh, through him and uh, the company he represents, got into offshore medicine and am absolutely loving it. This is one of the coolest things I've done in 20 years. So definitely. Yeah. The, uh, the reason I got into it was basically financial. Um, my wife was working for a hotshot trucking company and it was just a mom and pop hotshot trucking company. And I was working in the ER as a medic and her boss had a stroke. Well, I say the guy, the owner of the company had a stroke and shut everything down. So we lost her income. And I was like, well, I can go back on the truck and work on the ambulance and we'll make ends meet. And somebody reached out and it's like, well, you're already going to be working that much while you're home. What about going to the Gulf for two weeks? And so I started with a different company than the one I am at now. And I found uh, the remote medic while I was scrolling through TikTok on my first night in Lafayette, trying to figure out what the crap I was getting myself into. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we uh, we hit it up and that, that was, way. And... That was back in the early days when literally all I was posting was like me walking in a helicopter. I know, uh, yeah, that's a, yeah. You know, I don't think I ever even like actually voiced until. Um, Probably since Christmas. That's it. And I just thought it was so funny that um, a buddy of mine put me in touch with the remote medic. And he's like, I sent him your resume and he really likes you. He follows you on TikTok. I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> <Nice>. uh, <laughs> and that was, that, that was with my personal account. Um, I started the access to try to put the word out there for everything else that we can do as far as medics and EMTs. So that's, uh, yeah, that's why it's really new. You know, it's a bit of a mind blower for someone who is as big into autonomy and just like uh, advancing our field the way that I am. I cannot believe I had not been familiarized with the world of offshore medicine before this, because it's, it, it's not an industry. I told this to one of the yeah. Bessie guys. Uh, it's not an industry, it's a world. It's its own language. Yes. It's on rules, the, the scope of practice. It's not even a scope of practice. It's a set of binoculars. I mean, it's, it's just that wide, you know, oh, um, yeah. forgive the bad pun, you know. And if you guys don't know what Bessie is, that's the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement. It's basically like if OSHA and the EPA had a baby and it worked offshore, that's Bessie. Yep. And that, barely worked most of the time. That's yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was it, w it was the unicorn because we had a couple of I mean I, I'm from the south so a lot of my a lot of the guys around here went offshore uh, working mm -hmm. you know roughneck jobs and roustabouts and so a few of our medics actually went offshore to go work but you had to really know somebody to get in on the job and mm -hmm. that connection wasn't there until somebody uh, we'll call him B H uh, kind of put me in. <laughs> touch with the right person um yeah and i kind of lucked out right um you know growing up my dad was a, a drill ship captain uh he's a maritime officer started started as an ordinary seaman and hauls pipe all the way up to the bridge and, and ended up retiring after 22 years as a master able to sail any any size ship in the world um wow. so That's and as a drill cool. As a drill ship captain, you know, he, he, and, and we'll probably talk about this in other episodes, but the captain holds the legal authority for, for health, safety, and welfare of the crew. Um, 
and, and they hold the authority, but they also hold the burden, right? Yeah. So, so especially in the maritime environment, not really on platforms, but the maritime environment, the captains are incredibly involved in health and safety and welfare of the crew. Um, you know, so when I went into paramedicine, uh, you know, even from the beginning, I always knew that it was an option um, and, and was able to kind of build my career towards that goal, right? I was able to get hazmat technician, rope rescue tech stuff. And really kind of build my resume where and that's why i think it's so important that we talk about this stuff on TikTok and, and we record episodes like this uh, because it, it is a huge world that literally nobody talks about oh yeah but that's that's why i was so excited to be on it when you guys talked to me because i and 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 um access brought up a great point he said you're gonna work that much anyway and while it may seem counterintuitive that you get a lot of family time when you work offshore, you do because it's quality time. It is all quality time. I am at two weeks, I belong to my wife and my little girl. Yep. I never, never could boast that, whether it was in the service, 911, hospital, I never had that option. You're always getting ready for tomorrow or recovering from today or trying to sleep off a of 36. Oh my God. Um, yeah. And, yeah. So not, not only do you get this incredible scope of practice and by the way, guys, I have no conflict of interest. Nobody's paying me to say this. I'm, I'm <laughs> off the clock, you know, uh, but not only do you get this incredible scope of practice, you function with the best paramedics in the world. Um, you make fantastic money. You have real time with your family. I mean, I, I'd venture to say that, we have some of the most quality time with our families out of anybody in healthcare. You know, oh, if yeah. I had known about this before, I'd have got into it a lot sooner. That's why I was, and, and kind of circling back to the point, that's why I was so excited to be yeah. a part of this conversation. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, I, and you're not, your story is not abnormal, right? Um, my story, and, and this is the example that I use. Um, I, I mentioned, I, you know, I'm very open with it. I was kicked out of paramedic school my first time through because uh, I was that kid that you mentioned, right? The last kid to buy the book, the kid who's sleeping in class. Um, but you know, the second time through, I did it with a wife who was nine months pregnant when I finished paramedic school. And the dedication that it takes to become a paramedic at the, early in your career, if you want to get to this level, that we're at, the dedication it takes is things like my wife brought my youngest, my eight year old, my wife brought her home from the hospital by herself because mm -hmm. I was off taking my national registry skills for my paramedic. I'd already passed my written, you know, and I needed to feed my family and on a dual EMT income, we weren't doing that. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I had to leave them at the hospital to go take my paramedic skills test because we couldn't afford to wait. Yep. And, you know, it, those things sucked, right? You know, the, the dues we paid uh, through school, through the early parts of our, our career where we had to make those decisions sucked. But it's things like that that lead you to positions like this. You know, the guy who, the guy who's sleeping, in, the guy I was in the first time I went to paramedic school doesn't end up offshore, right? The guy who sleeps <laughs> through class, the guy who's sleeping on the truck instead of studying, those guys don't make it here. Yeah. Um, no, and, no. Yeah. I've said it before. It's the special forces of civilian paramedicine. You, you got to be self-motivated when you go out there because there's so much that, I mean, depending on, and I, when I was uh, talking about before, uh, I, I know remote can attest to this, but um, depending on where you are, you have a lot of downtime. And one of my yeah. first rigs, I was flat out told we don't want you to work because the only time you work is when something bad happens. Like, okay, well, what do you want me to do? Study. So I finished my yep. bachelor's degree. And, and you know, you're going to do that work either way, right? You're, oh, yeah. you're, you're either going to front load it on the front, you're going to bust your ass, you're going to go out and you're going to be, become the best paramedic you can so you can do other stuff. Or you're going to do the same amount of work but you're going to have a 30 year career with bad knees and bad back on an ambulance yep. and you hate your life and you, and you, you know, you're on your sixth di divorce. We all know the, we all know the horror stories, right? Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, but 
I think it's important that that we tell the followers that you know, this this isn't something you stumble into. It's something you start at the beginning of your career through hard work, studying. Um, whether you whether that's your intention or not, those are the people who end up at the top of the list when we go to start making phone calls. You you segued into what I wanted to say is it, it is the natural progression of the the pre-hospital provider who cannot get enough of it. It is to go to the highest level you can. Now, whether that's yeah. medical school or PA school or offshore, you know, if 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 you're a person who self-studies, you work really hard to be the best you can be, and, and you just stay buried in pathophysiology, it, it pretty quick you hit the end of the applicable limits of a protocol on any ambulance or dare I say helicopter. You know, you hit the end of it where you're you're now operating in this mental space where you know what needs to be done and you're no longer able to do it. Um, yeah. And this is a, a way to sort of shed those chains where, and I, I think I put this in a video, but you know, my scope of practice ends where the doc's faith in me does. Yes. You know, and and it is, and and it, the sky is the limit. So if you want to be um, essentially, you know, the the best healthcare provider you can be, where your only limitations are the work you put in, there are, there are two places you can do that. That's a wartime environment and mm -hmm. offshore. Yeah. That's it. You yeah. know, personally, having having been in both, uh, I'm digging offshore a little more. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I can I can completely understand that. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know the the other side of this, and one of my big things I talk about is the art and science of medicine, right? And it's the same in offshore. And in an anecdote uh, for access, he mentioned we had been to, we had been chatting for weeks or months uh, while he was at his other employer, and. Um, there, there's a Facebook group, and, and I'll ask uh, Access to share it uh, when we publish this. So, you know, the followers can also be a part of that Facebook group. Um, the decision maker for me, and, and I remember this vividly because uh, I called BH immediately when I saw it. It was six o'clock in the morning, and he was not happy to get my phone call. Um, <laughs> Access had, Access's platform had an issue uh in the middle of the night and the medic's not a production guy so he's not out there fixing it so what so what did access do access went and cooked breakfast for his guys um that's the kind you know so you you have to be you have to be both right you can't oh, just yeah. be the science guy and know it all you got to be able to step in and be a essentially a natural born leader and uh, you know, leaders eat last and leaders feed their guys. And, and for me, that was the, that was the thing. And the next day we had a project pop up and, and he got a job offer. <laughs> so let me yes. tell you about that. <laughs> Please do. Yeah, no, that's a good okay. story. I want to hear it. So, um, and again, it's all about timing. Um, hang on one second. Uh, I want to let me do it. There we go. Nope, that's not going to work. Are you trying to show your your beautiful pancakes that you cooked that day? <laughs> no, no, I was uh, I was going to try to see if uh, I could get uh, uh, medic in here, uh, but it's not letting me add him. I guess I've start, since we started the recording. Um, so I'm gonna have to do that next uh, time. Uh, yeah, can't win them all, man. Yeah, I'm trying, here, dude. I'm really trying. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so I I usually have a rule with the guys. I tell them it's like, look, I'm usually in my office till midnight, and it's it's not for any show of anything. It, it's to let them know that I'm there. Because, yeah. you know, we had guys that wouldn't go to bed till about midnight. And then my loopers, they wouldn't get home. They wouldn't get back to home. <laughs> they wouldn't get back home until one, two o'clock in the morning because they wouldn't finish up with their platforms uh, in time for the helicopter to take them back to the home platform. So the boat would bring them back and 
I would just sit up and chill. Now, granted, the company I was with, I was only getting paid 12 hours. And unless I was really justify anything over 12 hours, I was not getting that overtime. And so I was kind of chilling in my office and uh phone goes off and it's our uh, bigger platform that we're feeding oil to. He's like, hey, y'all just went down. About that time, I heard feet beating down the stairs. And it's the loopers coming down trying to uh, uh, trying to fix what was going on. So I went from medic to secretary because we only had four or five guys on a platform at the time, and I'm one of them. I have no idea how this thing works. And so I'm answering phones while they're downstairs trying to – trying to fix this thing to get the oil flowing again because they are losing millions by the minute. Right. And so the conversations usually went such and such platform is the medic. Is there anybody else we can speak to? Would you like me to stop them working to come up here and talk to you? Or do you want them to resolve the issue? Right. Fine. Uh, just have a, have them call us when they get done. I, I plan on it. <laughs> and, <That's... laughs> you, know, you know, when, um, when everything got fixed, and I mean, you, you could tell when it got fixed because when they opened up that valve, the entire platform shook. And nice. so everybody came in, and they were cold, they were tired, we cooked breakfast. And then when everybody ate and had a good time, we went went to bed, you know. And mm. so, and then I get a message from remote asking if I had a... Uh, uh, non-compete clause with my company. I told him I didn't, and he offered me a uh, offered me a, a short time gig. And I asked him if there was a full time opportunity, and he said, "As a matter of fact, there is. Are you interested?" It's like, yeah. So it, you know, what it feels it feels good to be recruited by you know one of the best companies in the world, and certainly the most advanced. You know what I mean? Yeah. That that's like not you know, and I'm always about keep your ego in check, but that that felt really good. Oh yeah. Yeah. It, you know it what did. I mean? And so, you know, I had been in contact with remote for months at this point and he's like, look, I know you're a family guy. I've only got temporary stuff right now. I know that you would like something stable so you can spend time with your family. As soon as I have something, I'll let you know. And I didn't push him. I just, mm. you know, I just, I'm not saying my first company was bad, but there's some stuff they could work on. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I bided my time and it, it, it all happened really fast. I mean, when it happens, it happens. And that's, I mean, that's the truth, man. Yeah. I, I went from a couple of text messages to um, uh, upside down in a fake helicopter very, very quickly. <laughs> but, you know, the, the fact that I was oh, yeah. so fortunate was not lost on me when I started really delving into the world and doing research and started kind of researching um, everything with us. It was not lost on me. Hey, wait a minute. This is this is the big boys. This is the big leaks. Yes. And and, you know, you brought up a good point that I would love for for just the viewers to understand about doing different jobs you know everybody on that rig has three four five jobs and oh God, yeah. i enjoy yeah. it because it reminds me of the time i spent um when i was in the service where i mean yeah i was a medic don't get me wrong but not everybody's hurt all the time and point of fact part of my job is to keep them from getting hurt and sick yeah uh, so I, I can't just sit around and do nothing which is good for a guy like me because i, I don't like being bored I, oh, yeah. I like being 100 miles an hour and oh, yeah. um that that's a big thing. I had a patient the other day um, who was incapacitated for a little while while we were doing some fluid recess and uh, their job was in, you know, in the galley. And so I went straight down to the steward and I was like, what are we cooking? What are we do? Yeah. You know what I mean? Because you're, you're filling that hole. And that ties into what you're talking about being self-motivated and self-starter. You know, you're not just, uh, and, and a lot of medics would have trouble letting go of this, which is why I want these, these guys to hear about it you don't the prima donna option is not there with this great power does come great responsibility but that responsibility is that of a team player so if you have that mindset you are right at home oh yeah you know and I, i'll be honest with you i am right at home on my rig it, it took two seconds for the oim and i to to get along because he knew right off the bat this 
this guy came to work and chew bubble gum and he didn't bring his bubble gum, yep. you know, and, and that is the greatest work environment ever where everybody's got their eye on the ball. I would rather work 20 hours straight with a group of go-getters than two hours with a group of lazy people. Oh yeah. And if you're, if you're that kind of guy offshore might be where you need to be guy yeah, or girl, the, whatever the case may be, you know, and the, Style of medicine that we practice, um, you have to have those team building activities, right? Um, you know, on the beach, I, I'm very selective when I go pick my healthcare provider, right? Uh, and I'm sure you guys are. When we're dealing with pediatricians for our kids, we go we go shop around, right? Oh yeah, these guys working offshore, they don't pick you, uh, so you don't have that inherent trust. Uh, oh yeah, and and we can dive into leadership and stuff in a different on a different episode, but trust is crucial in, in the patient provider relationship. And if you're not granted it from from being selected by the patient, then you got to earn it. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And, yeah, and, you, yeah, not... and Go guys, no, you're good. Guys, uh, these are hardworking folks. No matter what their job is, everything from you know, the cook to the OIM or captain in this industry aren't scared to work and they really hate lazy. Um, so they pick up on it and that that's a lack of trust. Do you need something? I need to get my charger. Okay. All right. I'll get it for you in a minute. Okay. Well, the charger's inside the bed. Knock yourself out. You're good. That's some of that quality time right there. You guys oh, see that? Those daddy oh, hugs. That's what it's all about. Them. Yeah, but I, I was list, I was listening to you, um, and and that's that's a big big deal. And for the guys who are thinking about going offshore, you know, I'll give you a, a brief anecdote about that. You know, um, if you come and ask me for Sudafed, you're getting an H E E N T. And one of the reasons for that, if you guys don't know, it's head, eyes, ears, nose, throat. And I always, you know, H L is always in parentheses, heart, lungs is always in parentheses there, because yep. um. When you're dealing with the lay person, they need to know a couple of things. For one, they need to know you care. You're checking everything. Two, this is behavior that their doctor does for them, right? So they equate this with a healthcare provider who's going to take care of them. And um, this is this is a big deal, even just psychologically. If you're a, if there's a cold spreading through the vessel and you're 100% sure that's what it is, it is part of the psychological method of ingratiating yourself and earning that trust. And you also have to understand that you're not dealing with a bunch of hypochondriacs. These no. are these are roughnecks. These are tough guys. By the time they come to you, um, it, it may be a serious deal. We all know the, the parables in EMS of when a farmer complains, it's time to worry. Um, yeah. these, these guys are tougher than a lot of farmers, and I live in a farming community. They're, they're yeah. as tough as woodpecker lips. So you have to take every opportunity you can to ingratiate yourself. And there's no better way to do that than to do a, a full exam and show them if there's anything here, I'm going to check for it. And then when you do find it, you fix it and you are given all the authority a paramedic could ever want to yeah. fix this stuff with the full support of a medical director who not only knows that that you're capable, but expects you to be. Yes. You know, so yes. uh, that that's if you're a really self-motivated provider, that's actually one of the perks of the job. And I just wanted to highlight that, that it's it's so wonderful to have access to all these these medicines and the tools and the training to use them. But if I ever hit a, a place where I don't know, um, I, I have somebody on the other end of that phone at 2 a.m. who's willing to train me. Yes. You know what I mean? It's yeah. It's that cool, you know, and our community is so tight knit um when mm -hmm. I'm not gonna get the situation, but it got to the point where there was uh there was something that I could not figure out on the paperwork side of stuff. And uh I called up Paradude and we wound up FaceTiming and he worked me through what was going on and it was just you know, it was fantastic. You know, if I've ever, ever had any problem, I, I, I never had, um, never had the, the thought that nobody's going to 
nobody's going to be there. They, everybody I've talked to, they've, they've been very outgoing and, um, and willing to teach and mm -hmm. making things an educational moment. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah. yeah, it's so an amazing they, thing. You know, I, I, I tried to toot someone's horn for them the other day. They were a substitute on the rig and they, they did all these these cool things while they were there when, you know, it, your normal 911 guy would have probably just sat and did nothing and said, well, I'm just here temporarily. And um, I was really just just praising this person. And then I kind of came to found out over the following days that, um, yeah, they did a good job. But that's the status quo here. And that was just yeah. a breath of fresh air that that is how we invest in each other's success and s sustainability. And, you know, in the and I, I don't mean this to sound as bad as it's about to. But, you know, in the backstabbing world of paramedicine where we eat our own young when we're not eating each other. Yeah. Um, you you want to talk about just a weight off your shoulders. It's huge. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. it's huge. Not running each other in the ground behind each other's backs is such a big deal. I mean, if we're picking on each other, that's one thing. But I'm talking, you know, that legit backstabbing, I just haven't seen it. You know no. what I mean? And yeah. it's, it's, and it's awesome, you know? Yeah. And I mean, it, it, and it all, I will have to say that I'm really glad that I started my offshore career on the shelf. Because the first platform I went to was maybe 15 miles offshore. It's like right, right on that border of, you know, being offshore. If it was a clear day, I could see shore. You know, mm -hmm. so it was, it was pretty good. And I only had a few people on my rig. And I learned a lot from those guys because you, you learn how to work with them as a team. And they, they learn to trust you. I mean, it, it took them, it took them a few days to get used to me. because. Uh, you know, they were, well, we got a new guy. He's he's a greenhorn offshore and he's a greenhorn offshore medic. And so, um, but I listened and I took their advice and, you know, we, see, so you got to go straight to a, a deep water where they have a galley crew. Um, <laughs> I'm the most fortunate guy on planet earth in this <laughs> position, buddy. Don't, please, don't think I don't count those blessings. Oh yeah, no, I, I completely understand. And... So when when I got there, I'm like, well, there's a cook's office. Why isn't there a cook? Well, because we only have six people on here, so they don't, they can't justify having a cook on board. We had 13 platforms, and only one of them had a cook, and it was the uh, area foreman. I mean, that was that was his platform, obviously. So the area foreman's going to have a cook, and it's going to have a galley crew, right? And uh, everybody else is just fend for themselves. So if we uh, if we made something that didn't taste good, it got fed to the fish. Uh, <laughs> which is one of my favorite things to do by the way i, I love to oh, do yeah that. oh yeah and uh, i was saw some dolphins uh, a couple of days before i went off oh yeah it was pretty cool uh the then, the, uh, dol the dolphins at allegheny like to <laughs> yes every yeah, morning they, um, every they, morning they're they have very, a all. yeah they're they're very open in their sexuality off the uh the allegheny <laughs> yeah. but you know, so and, and I don't know if you guys even know this, but I had never even been on a boat in the ocean. Uh, I, I, okay. I've been red fishing in the sound. That's all the saltwater experience I have. And the next thing you know, I'm in 3000 plus feet of water and uh, I'm seeing all the fun fish, which I like to throw apples to them because they fight over it, you know, and they'll get so thick that one will come up out of the water and he can't get back down you know, into the water. But uh I've, I've seen some very large marine life out there um, just under the surface okay. that I'll just see this outline come out of nowhere. And it's, uh, it's magic, you know, um, and then as a, a, I'm a space nerd, you know, and I, I guess I'm just sharing this. So the viewers, especially if they're thinking about going into it, can understand how beautiful it is. Um, you know, you get up on the helideck and, and there's almost no light pollution. So you see stars you've never seen. Um, and we have a, we have a spotter scope, which is almost like a telescope. Uh, on the rig that the OIM lets me borrow. And I mean, you can just, you can see the Milky Way galaxy sometimes, you know, it, it's just, you're surrounded by this torrent of of nature while you, you take in information like drinking from a fire hose and sort of ingratiate yourself all at the same time. When you put all that chaos together, it's a symphony. It's absolutely magic. You okay. know what I mean? And when, um, when I first got to my second platform, it was, uh, 
a few days in and figured I was the only geek there, the only space geek. And it was when they had the SpaceX reentry. Oh, wow. And yeah. So we're, I'm in the galley and everybody else is sitting out there looking at the phones and I was just, what y'all doing? Oh, SpaceX is coming over. I was like, oh, so y'all are going to go watch it with me. And they're like, yeah. So we all went up to the helipad and we, it was so weird because we're sitting out there and all we saw these lights going off to uh, where it was re-entering and we're like, oh, those are helicopters. And so <laughs> they, these helicopters are, you know, they passed over our platform and then we just, I've got a video of it up on my, on my uh, uh, first uh, TikTok channel. And it, oh, nice. it flew like almost right over the top of us. And we're just all sitting out there just, this is freaking awesome. Where else can you see this, you know, like this? And um, it, it, it was amazing. And, um, you know, it is, it is a completely, completely different world out there. And I mean, when I first went offshore, I, I asked my employers what it was going to be like. And they said, it's almost like prison. You're stuck on there. <laughs> And it, it, I, I, yeah, exactly, exactly. And <laughs> it's like you, you're you're stuck out there, and some people just can't handle it. And I was like, well, that's not cool. And um, and I'll I'll, I'll be honest with you, YouTube lied to me. I, I I looked up offshore medics on YouTube, and I was seeing like all these international vessels, and like looking at these weight rooms and everything, and. My first platform was <laughs> the Norwegian stuff. Yeah. Oh, I know, I know. I was like, oh, this is going to be awesome. And then my first platform was built in the early '80s, uh, and our weight room was up under the helipad with rusted out weights. And uh, that's now I'm on... <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> but take what you have there and make it worse. And <laughs> that's what my. <laughs> Uh, well, like you know, it, it's still cool, though, you know, and and, oh, yeah. and I was actually nervous about those large groups in large places and, and was thinking I wasn't going to like it. So when, when I encountered the the small place where there was a lot of improvisation and things, even in the weight room, uh, so to speak, yeah. um, that's that's where I'm at home. Oh, yeah. you know what I mean? And I, oh, and yeah. I love it. I'm sorry I cut you off. I just no, wanted no, to check that. But when I got out to Savon, where I am now, that weight room looks like a gold's gym. And it is fantastic. And depending on when you go, there's hardly anybody in there. And we got weight machines and treadmills and row machines and free weights. And um, it, it's they they definitely put a foot forward on in, encouraging your health out there. Because and I mean that was that was a big thing that because we're a dynamically positioned vessel like our top speed is three knots um and the captain is our oim and you know he he came in one of my first days out after training and was like all right this is this is kind of what i expect out of you and okay cool i mean we had a great conversation um and it was uh our biggest thing is our guys i was like yeah no i completely understand you know, and so uh, that's usually one of the first things that I tell people when they come out for um, for their rig induction is like, look, if my door is shut, I've got a sign on it. And it's usually because y'all keep it 60 degrees in here. And since I've lost 80 something pounds, I get cold. So I've got my heater on <laughs> <laughs> and I've got my jacket nice. on. So please come in. And I come in all the time and usually... The, the biggest one I get is, hey, Doc, you got any candy? Like, yeah, hang on. Let me go get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know, yeah. that brings up a good point because the health of the offshore worker has become a bigger focus. And if yes. if they if they are not in a manual labor position, it's very easy for them to become unhealthy in that oh, type yeah. of job if they do office or seated work or whatever, especially on production. Yes. platform you know so it's good to see that they're investing in that but then also you have to have a heightened sense of awareness as the medic out there that simple nausea may not be simple nausea because i was under the auspices of this was mostly going to be 20 year old guys who were really young and virile kind of getting out there and and doing their thing and i was very surprised to see as many people who were 
quinquagenarians, you know, 50, 60, 50, 60 year old people. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and, and that's, that's the rule, not the exception. Yeah. You know, so you, you have to pay attention to that kind of thing and, and be invested in their daily health. And then one other thing I wanted to put out that uh, when, when you said that it brought it up was uh, the medical minute, you mm-hmm. know, which I've and on, on the rig I'm currently on, I've kind of remonikered to uh five minute medicine. Cause okay. I, I do these quick classes okay. called five minute medicine that are sort of, they're, they're tailored toward the layman. Right. Yeah. And um, that's, that's an important part of the offshore medics duties is, you know, when you're, when you're all living right in there together to talk about the head cold, the chest cold, mold, cleanliness, personal hygiene, heart disease, yes. um, which I have found to be a very enjoyable part of my duties. But for somebody who's brand new to it, watching this, uh, this, whatever we'll call this here, they, they should be aware of that, that that's a, that's a thing you do as well, you know? Yeah. And I mean, we've got a, I've got a rescue team. Well, I've got, technically I've got two rescue teams on my rig. I, I have a day shift and a night shift and I've only got about 15, 20 minutes with them every week on Sundays. And mm-hmm. right now, well, when I go back out, I'm, I'm taking a, a page out of, um, what am I going to call them? I just went to uh, I just went to one of his classes. That guy, uh, uh, Uncle Phil. That's fine. Okay, Uncle, Uncle Phil. Phil. I dig so, it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I went to uh, so me, him and I were talking, and he gave Can me call him Doctor Phil. Yes, <laughs> yes. Okay, Doctor Phil. <laughs> Let's uh, do it. Yes, uh, <laughs> he gave me a lot of good um, tools for my toolbox. Yeah, you know, one of the biggest ones that. I'm I'm going to take back on this one is his idea for the code team. And he's like, yeah. if something ever happens, I've got 58 people lined up down the hallway, getting ready to do chest compressions and somebody scribing. And like, that's, that's really good because I know, because that's one of the first things I asked what, what kind of medical, um, what, what kind of medical uh, education do you have? And our rig clerk, she used to be an RN. Like, Hey, guess what? Uh, <laughs> I'm grabbing you if anything happens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. She goes, I shouldn't have said anything. I'm like, yeah, no, you shouldn't have said nothing. Um, but, you know, after uh, the doc brought that up and, and I put my team together, I mean, I did it that same day. Um, that, that cohesion you were talking about earlier led yeah. to there was no shortage of volunteers because everybody knows everybody. And uh, oh yeah, they're they're all about being part of a solution to a problem that may not yet exist. So that was a cool, a cool thing to see as a new guy, you know? Yeah, definitely. And that's one of the reasons I asked you on here is because we've got, we got somebody with a lot of experience. We've got somebody with moderate experience. We've got somebody with minimal. <laughs> yeah, minimal, yeah, almost done, yeah. <laughs> hey, no, yeah, I, no, man, no. I, I have no ego about that. And I even told that to the OIM. I said, look, on the medical end of things, I'm good. I got 20 years. Everything else, I am an idiot. Yes. If you're talking, I'm listening. You know what I mean? And and it's worked out great. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean I love gotta that. be humble. Oh yeah, yeah. And I all the time there were um the crews are in there and they'd be in there doing something. What does that do? And they'd explain it to me. I was like, Oh, I that's a little over my head, but okay, that's that's pretty cool. You know, and I love it when they hey, you want to go on a tour of the rig? Uh yes, I do. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I'm a science and engineering junkie. I've got a tally book that one of them gave to me, which is another sign they're investing in you. And, uh, you yes, know, it, it that goes with me like my wallet does. And I have so much written down because I'm an engineering and science junkie in all facets. And I've got so much written down about how this process works. It is truly amazing, you know. And then when you really start to try to learn about it, you know, they'll start bringing you kind of into the fold and you'll get to learn about it. I, I got to, I got to touch, I got to be the first human being to touch, you know, 300 million year old crude oil. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That, that's in my top 10 on planet earth. You know what I oh, mean? Yeah. That's so yeah. cool. You know? I mean, one of the, one of the coolest things that uh, was like when they, when they get to that point where they do show that you've got that trust and that that day came for me was when I was on my second platform and our loopers were out and our grocery boat had was late and it showed up and it was just me and the OIM. Or actually it's a PIC out there, uh, because the OIM's on a different platform. And he comes in, he goes, 
hey doc so that right there tells you that yeah. they already trust you because they, they don't it's it, if you're the medic they, they they have they have some respect for you and uh but you're the medic they start calling you doc it, it, it's it's a it's a whole nother level and it's earned yeah same way in yeah. the army it's earned it, you know yeah what I mean? and so my pic comes in he's like hey doc you got any experience rigging nope um, but if you show me what to do, I'm pretty sure we can figure it out. He goes, all right. <laughs> and so yeah. I, was, I was like, we, we had two choices. We could let the boat sit there and cost everybody else their groceries, or I could go out there learn how to do this stuff, get the groceries off and start unpacking them. And that's what we did. So I, I learned really quick how to rig. And if you're a self-motivated learned, guy, that's part of the fun of it though, right? Oh, you I know. All I these know. new things, you know? Yeah. And I mean, it was, uh, I found out what pigs were. And they, I, uh, they, uh, was like, Hey, uh, I need somebody to help me come pull pigs. Can you, can you lift some weights? Like, yeah, sure. So went down there and I uh, got some paraffin on my, got, got to look like an oiler for a little bit, you know? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so I meant, but it was just, you know, sure. Wrestle with him. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and, uh, so they they pull out this barbell looking thing that you can only grab with your two fingers and hope to God you're strong enough to carry that thing across the across the platform back into the box. <laughs> and, um, so it, and I mean it just it was random stuff and you, you came out your office and you helped cook you helped clean and you showed that you were part of the team and you know and it's a lot different where I am right now because yeah like they've got people that do that. And so the uh, the stewards kind of get a little uh, mad because when I hear <laughs> go down the hallway, I'll start getting my bags of trash out and I'll tie them up and set them outside my office and they'll come in and ask if I need anything. I'm like, no, no, I'm good. I appreciate it. And, you know, because um, it's just I, something to do, you know, but uh, like right now we're reorganizing the uh, reorganizing the clinic. And it's it's weird having a clinic because my first clinic was a broom closet like yes. i had no, i had no stretcher like my stretcher was a an office chair and my days yeah. yeah so and i think my first clinic was allegheny and you know i just made do with what i had and i was assessing people on couches and the day rooms and um they would because I, very rarely did i actually have a patient on my platform and I was mm -hmm. always flying out to other platforms to check on people. And so I would set them down in the in the day room and do my assessments and hope to God I brought what I needed because the the limited stuff I had was 140 pounds. And I had to take that up all flight of stairs and load it up in a helicopter. And then if I was lucky enough, somebody would help me take it down <laughs> when I got to the new platform. And well, you know, yeah, no, I'm with you on that. Out there on the two five four, I keep, you know, I, I keep an otoscope in my pocket i've always got a you know i've got an otoscope a stethoscope and a pulse ox in my in my hard hat you know and i always carry it down with me yeah. and uh that way i can do it in the day room or whatever because that's kind of how you have to catch some of these guys and when yes. you got guys dealing with earplugs you know you want to make sure you're staying on top of uh oh, any yes. potential for outer or inner ear infections for that matter but uh getting to what you were talking about earlier i've got this thing where i make my rounds where uh, i've got a I've instituted, I kind of invented this, it's called a no kidney stones policy, where okay. uh, I okay. make my rounds sometimes twice a day, I carry, you know, ice cold water, I've got a little mini cooler, and I actually get out on the deck, hard hat, FR gear, you know, the whole nine, and I carry yeah. this stuff out to them, um, because that's another thing that I think it's good for a medic to do, especially when they're new, is to yes. show like, hey, I'm, in, I'm invested in your well-being, I don't want you to get sick, if you get yes. sick, I'll patch you up. But an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And they've heard me say yes. that, you know, until they're sick of it, you know. And and it, it just reminds me of my days of, of when I was in the service. And if, if, you know, for anybody watching this is thinking about getting into this, you know, if you were a medic or a combat lifesaver in the service and uh, or wilderness medicine, for that matter, and that's the mentality you have, you will probably do quite well. You know, yes. they they appreciate that. And when you and this is one thing I've I've learned very quickly is that when you invest in these guys, you get that back with interest. You know what I mean? 
they they invest in you quickly and uh, it's awesome you know? oh yeah yeah and i mean it went away oh <laughs> my train of thought derailed uh, bro, uh, sometimes my train of thought is a caboose. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's that's all I got. I'm sorry. I, and I, I, man, I have ADD, so I just interject, and I'm so sorry I do that. No, no, you, you're good, uh, yeah, squirrel. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> we're I, mean, I, I, I feel like you have to have some sort of ADD to be able to do, you know, um, and you have to kind of rein it in a little bit when you're when you're back off. So, oh, so the yeah, waters, yeah. yes. So the waters uh, are a really good thing. We have the um, uh, the electrolyte lollipops, uh, popsicles, and uh, BH was like, hey, so when it's hot outside, get you a cooler, um, take it with you around, and they will appreciate it. I was like, that's a really good idea. And so, and that, that was that was always a big thing was um, that I like about this is the fact that these people have these tools that, you know, these experience that they're willing to to share with you and you take it, you put it in your toolbox and you become a very fantastic provider. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and uh, so it, listen, <laughs> listen <laughs> and, and be a sponge and take it all in. And I mean, I know there's uh, some pharmaceuticals that I was not familiar with and I'm in the book. I'm learning about it. I want to know how it works. I want to know what to use it for. Um, I want to know what the dosage is. You know, I don't, I don't want to be on the phone with uh, Dr. G and like, uh, so yeah. what you want me to do, doc? No, that's not what he wants to hear. He wants to hear yeah. this is, this is X, Y, Z. This is what I think it is. And this is the treatment plan I think will work. What do you think? And uh, if there's a adjustment that needs to be made, um, uh, he will he will address it and he's very good about it and if you're spot on then he's very good about letting you know that you're spot on you know but um and we're really lucky right um oh we're extremely lucky the culture that that we work within you know and we're this episode we're we're talking fairly general about the industry um the the things we're talking about like peer support Aren't, not every offshore company is cut from the same cloth, so you, you're not going to see that in some of the other offshore medical operators. And, and access, you mentioned that earlier a bit, uh, but we're, you know, and you mentioned Doc. Um, you know, we're we're extremely lucky that this is a guy who's been a professor at a medical institution. He's been in attending with residents. He's taught PA and nurse practitioner programs and supervised those guys. And he 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 treats our medics the exact same way that he does a PA and nurse practitioner, and he says it every single time. Um, he he treats our our medics the exact same way that he would a first or second year EM resident um, who's not who's in that semi-autonomous, uh, near 99% autonomous realm. Um, not all offshore medical operators are cut from that same cloth. Um, you know, so I want to temper expectations for uh, some of the viewers, but there's opportunities out there where you get the keys to the kingdom from a guy who's got not one, not two, but three different fellowships behind his name. Um, so th- there's really cool chances. Um, you know, and sometimes just like on the ambulance, and like we talked about at the beginning, sometimes you got to pay your dues, right? Um, yeah. Sometimes yeah. you don't luck out and, and end up at the cool place. You might have to go work on the shelf in some of these places like Access is talking about to get to those cool spots. Or you might end up like Shade Tree and just happen to luck out that that's where the opening is, <laughs> and you're and you're qualified and you're willing to do it and the timing's right and the stars align and you end up there. Right? Oh yeah, um, absolutely. But I, just to point out something that you you had brought up, you know, in in for the go getter medic who's watching this that wants to 
you know, advance themselves. Very often when we have conversations with physicians in the hospital, there is, there's a dichotomy there. There is a, a, you almost, you're not supposed to speak out of your league. And we even see that bred in the culture in the comments on my videos, that's out of your scope. The, the first time I spoke to Doc about a patient that was sort of multifaceted and complicated, um, you know, I put together an entire treatment plan. I had what labs that were available to me that were pertinent to it and all that. He did not take offense to that. He did not talk down to me. He addressed me like I was, uh, like he was just a senior colleague as opposed to the, the king and the peasant, which is oh so common. Yes. for the 911 medic and it was for one it was it was very nice to be spoken to in a, in a respectful manner but also it was this evidence of the the standard to which we are held that uh i i knew i was right at home when that happened as in okay i i'm not going to be penalized for going this in depth i am expected to know this and be able to take care of this patient on you know the off chance that if communications are down, this person wants this man wants to trust me to make the best decisions that can be made in his absence or the absence of that communication. And oh, yeah. what what makes this even better, you know, if you can draw a you know a little exponent beside it, is that we have that weekly training. You know, so you get training on the phone, you can get your questions answered at any time. You have this entire team of again best medics in the world that you can lean on. And then also you you get training with your medical director, you know, weekly, you oh, know, yeah. And, yeah. and you just you constantly are expanding. And, um, I, you know, just for any anybody who's watching this that and I hope some people watch this that are go getters that, that want to expand into this field um, that that's a huge thing for people like me, again, looking from the new guy's point of view to find a place where I can be used to the fullest extent of my capabilities and a capability I don't have yet, they will add to, they will train in me. Um, you know, for all of us who, who have been dying to operate at the top of our game, that's, that's paradise. And I know somebody's going to watch this. It's going to feel the same way. You oh, know yeah. what I mean? And, and that's, that's great. It's, it's a breath of fresh air in an industry that has become, so overregulated, and the training wheels have been applied to every protocol book to the extent that it has on onshore on shore on the beach. Um, it just it's not like that out there. We're not cowboying. We're just very well trained, and when a deficiency is identified, we get trained even further. And that's pretty friggin' cool if you're a medic, you know. Well, oh, and most definitely. For me, the coolest part of this, right? And it's no secret that that burnout is a big topic in EMS right now, and a big factor of that is the reimbursement model in EMS. And now, you know, from my side, trust me, I had those same frustrations, right? I, I was in leadership in EMS on on the ground, and that's all we talked about was you know we only make three or four percent margins, and you know barely making payroll and this and that, right? Um, so the, the the pressure comes from an administration, and so that's where you get EMRs that aren't true EMRs. They're billing platforms with the the patient platform oh, yeah. just tacked on top, oh, yeah. and it's yeah. shit and doesn't work, and it's garbage. You know yeah. that's where Hot you garbage. get the <laughs> that's where you get the you know penalizing people for refusals and like you know if your refusal rate's above twelve percent, then we got to have a conversation. Yes, you know, and you get pulled in the office. Um, yeah. We don't have those. We're paid a set amount, uh, and it's actually in our company's financial benefit to keep their employees healthy. When they get sick, they cost more money. They they cost supplies that the that the client doesn't pay for because we get you get this much money per month per location to keep our guys healthy and safe. Period. Um, you know, and, and does it cost money? Absolutely. Um, are we are we making money hand over fist? Not really, uh, but we're able to deliver quality, and we have a financial incentive to deliver quality care and preventative medicine and practice at the highest level uh, to prevent the cost of extremely expensive medevacs when you're talking 220 miles in the middle yeah. of nowhere. 
And on a micro level, it is a good example of how um, your, your, I don't want to say socialized medicine, but it, it, it is a good example of how that can work with very proactive um, providers, you know, and, and of course, when you get into like federal government and the entirety of the world and, and say even the United States, that gets a little more complicated, but it, it really shows what can be done when you're investing in what is basically a primary care model, right? Which is a great deal oh, yeah. of, of what we do. It's primary care. Primary care is cheap and it's good for everybody, patient included. Yes. And it, it's, you know, very enjoyable to me to keep someone healthy. Um, but, you know, I, I learned a long time ago, I liked taking IVs out a lot more than I liked putting them in because <laughs> I, I liked seeing yeah. patients get healthy, you know, and that was something I was consistently deprived of in the 911 system and the 911 model and the emergency medicine model in general, to be frank. But uh, here, especially, and, and, you know, maybe that doesn't mean a lot to somebody that's watching this, but to see somebody come in dizzy with an inner ear infection, go through the whole thing, do a full exam, um, for lack of a better word, prescribe the antibiotics. Of course, the physicians involved in this intimately, I don't want anybody to think we're cowboying out here, you know. No, we're and, not. And watch that person get 100% better. And not only that, but physically be able to look at that tympanic membrane every day and watch the progress happen. Yes. You know, if, if you're watching this and, and, and you're in this field for the right reason, you see the magic in everything I just said. And that's then it. to know that that's a profitable model that keeps people healthy, what more could you ask for in a healthcare system? You know, and again, they're not paying me to say this, guys. This is, you know, I'm just, I, you know, hopefully you guys have followed the channel long enough and, and you know that I'm qualified. I can work anywhere I want. And um, I'm thrilled they chose me. That should say something about the the company and, and the way that they run things and the way that offshore medicine works. I hope yeah. it does anyway, you know. Yeah, and, and that when we first started talking, that was one of the first things you said was what like, dude like, we can talk, but you know, I, I'm not in a hurry. I'm not gonna go into something that sucks. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, I came back and said, Well, I'm not I'm not in a hurry either. Um Yeah. You know, so so let's sit That's down and volume. talk. Let, yeah. Let's sit down and talk and, and see if cultures align, see if visions align, see if you're going to be a good fit for the team. Um, if you're going to bring value to those those weekly calls with Doc and with the rest of the team. And uh, you know, as we talked, we we realized that our visions aligned and uh, and it worked. And you know, so often. Um, Probably the three of us. Probably the biggest question we get is, "What certifications do I need?" Uh, <laughs> yeah. The, cert the yeah, certifications the don't matter. Certs don't matter, right? I love um, that. By the way, I just love yeah. hearing that come out of your mouth. I love oh, that. Yeah. I know that so much, so much. Yeah. And, and I'll put a, <laughs> I'll put a list up, and next time I'm just going to make up some acronyms and put them on there and see what happens. <laughs> yeah. But if you don't have PHTLS. And you bring a ton of other value. Um, you bring something new. Uh, Access is a prime example. He didn't have PHTLS, and he went through a contract that it's required. But I was able to say, "Hey, look, this is a guy when shit's hitting the fan. He's gonna go cook. He's gonna go drop pancakes on a griddle." Uh, nice. That speaks yeah. <laughs> that speaks volumes to us, but it also speaks volume to clients, right? So um, they see the value in that. And they understand that this is far more than just this isn't a helicopter where you check boxes and you can go be a flight paramedic. This is uh, truly practicing medicine at the top of your game. You got to be at the top of your game. Uh, yeah. And certifications don't mean that. Um, you know, we're really wanting to push for degreed paramedics uh, is going to be a, a big push in the offshore environment in the future. That's not because we want to add another checkbox. That's because we want guys with critical thinking skills um, who can think critically and think outside the box and have it demonstrated. Um, it, it's not just checkbox. 
and you're you're a certain level of education you can only obtain yeah. with a, a two or three or four more years of study but before you move on too far i just wanted to tell you that this is the only medical environment i've ever been in 20 years nine countries this is the only one i've seen where heart matters as much as it should oh yeah you know and, and more than the dirt and, and i'm sorry to interject but i just i wanted to make that point while that was fresh in everybody's mind because that's a Absolutely. big deal and that and that's that's one reason why I feel that going on the shelf was really good for me and having that experience um before I, I came out this far because the the first company I worked for, I mean they like again, like I said again, they're not a bad company. They're they're a good company. They were looking for somebody with a medical license and a heartbeat. And and we've seen how poisonous that is to our institution yes, nationwide. Definitely. You know? I learned a lot more from the guys I worked with offshore than I did with the with that company. And I mean they they did invest in us, but it was like pulling teeth to um to try to to try to get anything out of them. You know, they wanted us to be uh uh the the layperson CPR instructor. Um, it was the, yeah. the hands-on. And so after about three months of hounding them, they finally sent me the instructor class, but I still had to go for, um, go for my practical and it never happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I here, I said, Hey, I need PHDLS and let me know when you're back on shore. You know, so yeah. I mean, and um, and I will have to say that the the guys I worked with, you know, they they instilled that. I mean, it's a brotherhood. It's a you know, it's a it's your family while you're out there. You know, we play cards in the evenings. You know, I'm I'm not just the the doc. I'm also the some somebody to come talk to when crap's going on. You know, I mean on my second platform. Which is huge that you have to be ingratiated to be that mental health professional. Oh, I know. In an austere yeah. environment and you need to be the guy yeah. for that job. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I, I did feel like a top or a first shirt for the longest time because we had guys that would come in that were making all this money. And, you know, I was on the, my first platform. I was the youngest person on the platform. And my second platform, I was the second oldest person on my platform. And so I would have guys come in all the time and they they would come talk just to talk and they'd be like, well, I'm thinking about getting a new truck and let's, <laughs> right. let's, let's, take, let's take a step back. Let, let's see what's going on. You know, so one of the yeah, guys. I'm, I'm going to buy an F950 that's going to sit at the heliport for 180 yeah. days a year. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, right. and so the, these guys would come talk and they would, um, you know, I was like, look, learn from my mistakes. Don't make the same mistakes I did. And so let's, <clears> let's, let's, let's sit down and talk about it. And we had, uh, I want to try to be as vague as possible. Um, I'm trying to make sure I don't get hit with anything from YouTube. So it, yeah. Uh, Big daddy it, YouTube. Yeah. It dealt with, uh, SI. Right. And, yeah yeah and it was a it was a real big thing and you know he he felt comfortable enough to come talk to me and um i was like look all right i appreciate that you came to talk to me however this is what needs to happen now and i'm not doing it because um i'm not doing it because i'm i'm being a unpleasant person i'm doing it because i care about you and he was he was okay with that. So within a few hours, we had a field flight coming in. The only thing that OIM knew was that I had a guy that needed to go in. I flew in with him and made sure somebody was there to pick him up and take him where he needed to go. And that's such a huge thing, you know, that yeah. somebody can come to you and trust you with that. And and that's that's yeah. built, you know, brick by brick. And it, it's oh, a yeah. testament to how good you are as a healthcare provider. And that's something that that people need to understand because psych is sort of this forlorn overlooked thing in the 911 system. Um, oh God. You yeah. know, when we think of psych, the first thing that goes to the average paramedic's mind is sedatives. Um, yes. And if, if you do have that altruistic 
streak in you, you know, you, you want to be as well read on that as you are on your antibiotics, you know, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. not just de-escalation from violent episodes, but, you know, how do I listen? How do I convey empathy? And if you're the kind of person that it genuinely tugs at your heartstrings, and I'm one of those, I'm a, I'm the size of a grizzly bear, but I'm a teddy bear, you know, exactly. um, it genuinely bothers me to see somebody at the bottom of the barrel because, you know, more we know now it's more than 22 vets a day commit suicide. I had several, yes. several friends that, well, uh, one, that one have died the, from that, you know. Yeah, one of the stories that I tell, and I mean, I, I know Matt, Matt's probably heard it. I know, uh, I know Paradude has. Um, uh, my dad was a vet and we found him at work. And I was yeah, the geez, first medic on scene. Yeah. So it was hard for a while and I had no idea. Like I talked to him the night before and he was a medic and he was, uh, he was a firefighter with the air force, um, did desert storm stuff with the, uh, SAC in Omaha. And mm. they, um, worked with the, worked with the state of Alabama and things just, were going south and he didn't think there was a, a way to fix it. And so he did it. And, um, yeah, for, I, that, that screwed me up for the longest time. And I had a, and that's, so, that's yeah. so hard to hear. You know, I had a dear friend that was in a, a just similar context and he was, uh, I mean, it's nowhere near what you've, what you're talking about there. I don't want to try to make it sound like I'm trying oh, to go one up, but he was a father figure to me as a very yeah. young punk kid. He was, you know, these books, everybody's asking me, where do you get this information? He was the guy who showed those to me and uh, Staff Sergeant Thomas DeLeon. And, and, you know, and I, I don't mean to get emotional about it, but <laughs> um, he, you know, when you said that, like it hit me hard, he, you know, we called him D, um, there, some things had gone down, nothing terrible. It was just, he was going to be medically, um, discharged. This was the only thing he had ever loved was being a medic in the service and he saw no way out. Yeah. And he didn't tell anybody. He gave no clues. He, yep. and, and D was that kind of guy. He was the kind of guy who, who thought things out and did not share his planning process, whether it was, uh, a tactical observation or in this case to end his own life and uh, nobody knew nobody yeah. had a clue until it was all over exactly you know and exactly. Um, that is that is something that you can only prevent by being that person that a, that someone else can see a safe space in and of course in a, in a very masculine world which offshore is yes you know and, and don't get me yeah. wrong man i'm a masculine guy i, I like all those things but um you know, in a very masculine world where you hide your emotions, um, people will absolutely sit there and um, let it ferment until the point that the demon is no longer manageable. And that's a huge part of being an offshore medic. It's, it, like I say, it's just as big as knowing that methicillins treat pseudomonas, that you have to be that guy. And I only know that as a new guy offshore because I learned it all too well when I was with small teams, you know, working with infantry units and PSD teams and even spec ops, you know, yeah. you have to be that guy. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But if you're the consummate healthcare provider, it almost comes easy, doesn't it? It does. You know what I mean? It, it comes too easy to show people you care about them if you really do. Yeah. And one of the funniest things that um, that I tell everybody, if you ask anybody, and I mean, you could probably ask the guys on the Allegheny, um, whenever I would walk around, the first thing out of my mouth was, Hey, how's it going? And it's not just mm -hmm. a, not just a passing thing. I really want to know how's it going? Because mm -hmm. if it's not going okay, then we need to figure out what's going on and, you know, work on mm -hmm. it. They're struck by that. that too. When you come up to them, you say, Hey, I saw you limping when you got off the chopper. How's your knee today? Hey, yep. how's that medicine working for you? How's that, how's that ear today? You yep. know, because this is this is an interaction in healthcare that the average American has never had in any facet. You know, you, you schedule a follow up appointment with your doctor and he goes, uh, OK, um, and now what were you in here for last time? Yeah, Versus oh somebody, God, yes. You know, somebody coming down at breakfast and they order too over easy and they say, how's that left foot doing? You know, you know what I mean? That's, you okay. know, it, but again, man, it's 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 like the same way you can't hide being a bad person. You know, yeah, you cannot hide being the consummate medical provider, healthcare provider. 
And uh, I just wish more people who were like me, who loved it like I do, knew that this world existed. Um, I guess I do when I don't. It would have been a lot harder to get a job. I'll tell you that. <laughs> you know, if, if if all the yeah. certified awesome people knew about it, man, I feel like they'd be beating the door down. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Well, and team health. Oh, you mentioned wow. team health. That's a team, that's a lot in the in the back room there. Um, yeah, you saw that too, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Shade Tree, you mentioned uh, team health, and and really one of, one of the things I want to discuss this week is the the type of team health that that we bring, in, and you compare it to special operations medicine and infantry medicine. It's very similar. Mm-hmm. Um, not only do you, and you mentioned the accountability on your team, right? The Hey, are you taking your meds? You're you're limping and you hadn't been. How's your gout doing? You're not doing mm-hmm. what you're supposed to do, are you? But that 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 accountability goes both ways, right? Where um and, and once you become really good at offshore medicine or team medicine, you realize that that this is these these guys become your friends and family. Uh yes. so and and we we all seen um, our family members as patients, right? But every interaction that you have in this environment is that same feeling where um, it's that internalized pressure to always succeed and always get better. And if you don't feel that as part of your team, then you're, you, you shouldn't be there. Um, exactly. You know, you're, you're not part of that team if you're not feeling that pressure uh, and, and I've made medical errors in the offshore environment, and it's not a fun feeling uh, to have that conversation. But I think you have to. You you owe it to not just yourself, but you owe it to that team member that, hey, man, look, I'm human. I screwed up. I'm going to get better, right? Yes. Um, and, and, we, and we've talked a lot about heart and humility and that team, that team medicine approach and the accountability for health backwards and forwards is not something you're going to see in any other part of medicine besides at these high levels with high performing mm-hmm. teams. These guys value that integrity too. You know, when you look them in the eye and, and you, you tell them hundred percent, Hey, you know, X, Y, Z, like you're talking about, maybe I made a mistake or a, you know, in the absence of that, because I'm still new to the field and have not yet done that, you know, I'll look them in the eye and say, you know what? I don't know. And at this point, there's not a way to know, but let's try this course of treatment. If it works, we'll know that's what it is. You know, whereas um, they they get they don't get that information from their average family physician because there there's a different type of leadership mentality. I'm not criticizing uh, any physician anywhere. There's just a different leadership mentality and one that the average physician cannot adopt without such close relationships as you build and, and what you have with the people on the rig. They, um, and I, we, we talked about this on the phone earlier. Um, we, we, we got into it, but I'm a big fan of the patch Adams model. Oh, um, yeah. the real patch Adams, not Robin Williams, where they say, yeah. give your doctor permission to be human. And while I am not a doctor, I'm an extension of doc's hands. Right. And, um, if, if you are, you know, a very caring person, you're empathetic and you have integrity, your patients at any level, they will give you permission to be human. And um, in my mind, that's what the med- this whole medical experiment was always supposed to be. You know, yes. you were always supposed to be a trusted and learned colleague who was, was not overly egocentric, who is able to say, I made a mistake or, hey, I don't have a way to know right now, but I'm going to be with you every step of the way on this and we're going to work it out. And, and, you know, if the if the entirety of especially the American healthcare model could go closer to that, yes. you wouldn't have the mistrust you have in the medical community right now, vis-a-vis things that you don't say out loud because algorithms, you know, ban your video now. But you know, yes. massive disease states, if we had not tried to maintain some sort of false sense of authority, not us, but you know, the medical model. We yeah. would be giving our healthcare practitioners permission to be human, and we would have been together on a lot of what we've gone through since 2020, as opposed exactly. to so many conspiracy theories and, and and all the insanity. Yeah, you know. And I, I mean, when when I have guys that flat out 
come talk to me because that's the first thing out of the mouth is I trust you more than I do my doctor at home. I'm like, uh, I appreciate it, but I don't have that MD. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I appreciate it, but don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, know, you know, and um, so, but I mean, there's, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm looking for words because I don't want to, don't want to screw anything up. Uh, I'm with you. I, I get it. I get that. Uh, yeah. There's a certain diagnosis that will follow you um, um, throughout your life, like hypertension. We'll use that one, hypertension. And, you know, we uh, we talked about that in one of our case studies. And it's, it's like, all right, man, you, you need to go see your primary care doctor because I can acutely take care of this but there's something underlying that's causing this. Um, and there's only so much I can do. And the last thing I want to do is you have a hypertensive crisis out here. And that's, that's with you for the rest of your life. You know, mm -hmm. so let's, let's, let's try to, I, I understand that you, that you trust me, but there's only so much I can do. So let's, let's, let's work on, Let's work on your health. Let's work on you being you because um, when we go into safety issues during my rig induction, just like everybody goes home, everybody goes home better or the same, but everybody goes home. You know, well, you know the good end of that trust is that whereas they may not listen to their own family practitioner telling them, hey, come back and see me when, you know, and I'm seeing this very early in the process when I say, hey, you really have to follow up, um, you know, recently and, and, and um, you know, you guys know a little bit about this one where I followed up with a certain patient and said, hey, you've really got to talk to your GP about insulin therapy. Yes. Whereas they may not listen to their doctor say, come back and see me, they will listen to you. So there is an upside to that trust that actually benefits their GP in taking care of them. And um, it's it's kind of a testament to how efficient and how well the medical system can work when you build patient relationships, you know what I mean? Oh, oh yeah. And, and not just patient relationships, but patient centric relationships, right? Where, Hey, that's yes. Uh, yes. You know, yes. The egos are checked at the door. There's no reimbursement model that we're worried about. Um, the patient comes first. You can do those really cool things. And, and, and I say it all the time, the reimbursement model that we have removes a lot of the barriers that challenge our healthcare system. Um, the interoperability, the the culture that we've developed removes barriers that we all see in every ER that we walk in, every clinic we walk into. Um, our company has 13 clinics and that's what our company develops things in offshore and rolls it out across the system because we're this awesome little uh, petri dish controlled <laughs> environment okay. with with very little external factors so we can kind of do we can develop these really cool things really quickly um and, and that's one of those things this is culture of you know reimbursement and external factors get in the way of the patient centric model um you know, and I hope that things like, you know, raising awareness about what we do and, and the potential opportunities that healthcare has to learn from us and we can we can learn from the rest of the industry. You know, the the things we have we're developing now will impact community paramedicine specifically within the next three to five years, period. God, I we hope so. That. And because you brought that up, I want to get on my soapbox for just give me 30 seconds and then you yeah. can pretend like the feed got cut because I got too radical. But, you know, I, it, it's the, the barriers that we don't experience in, in terms of patient care, patient patient centric models. They exist because of the the monetary gatekeeping between a patient and their primary care provider. I am all, I am completely fine with a for-profit insurance model that deals with catastrophic insurance. 
but our for-profit model now keeps people out of their GP's offices. And we can talk about that in depth on another episode as far as why your doctor collects co-pays and what happens when they don't and how it will ruin them forever. Um, but it, it is so cheap to pay for primary care and so in the business mindset lucrative to keep people out of the hospital that it is absolutely mind boggling to me that we don't have that in everyday America. Because if we can make it work and make it, for lack of a better word, profitable, a hundred nautical miles across the ocean in miles of water. It can work in small town USA to the point that we not only, I mean, this is the kind of money you could measure in savings to the GDP. This is yeah. huge money. If we just stop patients from using their primary health care provider insurance, you know, and, and, and we, we have to stop the companies from stopping them. And, it, and you, you brought up a good point. This is a microcosm of the larger picture in America. And we are, in many ways, maintaining a lot of these guys' regular, everyday healthcare needs with a physician at the helm, and, and yeah. we're doing it rather well. We're doing it at a, at a great cost-to-benefit ratio that would, you know, be exponential. It would be orders of magnitude better financially on land, oh, but yeah. you just cannot get the American healthcare system behind it. And it yeah. leads to things like, like, you know, Access just said, I trust you more than I doctor. Then my doctor, well, it's it's because I can afford to show you I give a damn. And sometimes your doctor can't, you know, because all, all that this model has really done is absolutely put a stranglehold financially on the uh, primary care physician. Most of them go out of business if they don't get involved with the conglomerate, and that yeah. carries its own problems. You know, you got to see X amount of patients a day to even break even or you have corporate breathing down your neck. And, and that is never going to lend itself to good patient outcomes when you got to see a patient every seven minutes. Yes. You know? Yes. And if it can be made to work in the most austere of environments, good God, man, why can't we do it in everyday town USA? You know? Anyway, oh, yeah. I'll get off my soapbox, but I, I had to throw that in there. Maybe somebody – will will hear that early in their career and go on to be uh, someone of influence and, and help help fix that model. Hey Amen. I, I like that. I like that. Uh, also, uh, Shade Tree, we really got to get you in that next CCPC class. Or sorry, CCPC down. class. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, I've been uh, eyeballing that, and I know that um, we'll call it Mr. C. Mr. C is starting another one soon, if I understand it correctly. I'll be there. That's all. I mean, it's... It's unfortunate my situation with that class, but I, I love. I'm still going back through and watching you're the still, videos. You're I, still I know in it. Yeah, so, yeah. So get put your nose down and get caught up, and you'll be fine. Oh yeah, uh, trust me, I am. <laughs> it, it's it's <laughs> just. Um, Paradu's got a question. Uh, do we require remote or do? Do we require NR EMT or is it a state license? So th this is, uh, and, and if you want, we can start going. I I know Shade Tree has some questions from his TikTok, and then I have a few. Um, so I, if y'all want, we can. I think you know these guys have been hanging out with us. So I think we hit their questions first. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and and then we can we can jump into the Q and A before we kind of end it. Uh, okay. So NREMT, uh, no, it's not required. Um, is it a great idea? Yes. Why? Because most of our stuff is, is um, fairly stationary. We do get vessels, though, that go all over the place. Um, but they're, with a new EMS compact uh, and the way it's set up with a privileged practice, um, rather than requiring individual license as long as you're working the the regulatory side of this has actually made it really easy um, national registry makes accessing the ems compact much easier uh, so you can go state to state much easier uh, but if you're one of the 22 states that are in the ems compact we we will accept that state license 
Um, it's not an industry standard. Um, so once you get beyond three miles, uh, state law doesn't matter anymore. Uh, at that point, you're in what's considered federal waters up to uh, the international uh, international waters line, which is typically 12 to 15 miles from shore. And then out to up to 300 miles, you're in what, at least in the U.S., is you're in what's called the exclusive economic zone. So anything in there that makes money, the U.S. government's responsible for. Uh, everything else, it's international waters, it's free game. Depending on if you're a U.S. flagged ship or registered ship, then absolutely you're going to follow U.S. law, even in international waters. Um, the U.S. CFR that covers the EEZ just says that you have to be a licensed healthcare provider in the United States. Um, it doesn't require a specific state or a specific national registry. For us, it makes it easier, like I said, for going state to state. It also makes it a lot easier on uh, recertification uh, because it, it's fairly cookie, cookie cutter. Okay. Uh... And, okay. and we we have guys who don't have. We've got guys licensed in North Carolina, uh, Florida, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, Alabama, Alabama, uh, <laughs> Arizona. A lot Arizona. of those states. A lot of those states do require registry as well. So you have to maintain your dual licensure between registry and state, but. Um, Typically, those states that do require it just mirror the registry requirement. So you get them both in one shot. I got you. And, I, and I'll pay for both, right? Because I, I want you to be able to have that proof that you're competent. Nice. Now, I know that this is a question I get asked a bunch. And it's, uh, can I be an EMTB or just an EMT and work offshore? No, absolutely not. Um, and... And if you've listened to this point, you should be able to understand why. Uh, the EMT, so, so for EMTs, you got you to gotta remember the remote nature of the work that we're doing. Um, there's times where we have paramedics who are closer at a specific moment in time to the International Space Station, which is 220 miles above us. They're closer to the astronauts on ISS than they are to healthcare. Uh, the EMT is not, the EMT scope of practice, the EMT knowledge base is not designed for that type of environment. The EMT scope of pra practice and education is designed to keep people from dying and get people 90 minutes maximum to a hospital. Um, the advanced EMT model, there's really no difference. Um, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of AEMT to begin with. Uh, I think EMT should be AEMT and I'm not a huge fan of AEMTs in independent practice by themselves. Um, they're great for procedures, but they don't have the knowledge base to really understand the hows and whys and the true impacts to the things that they're doing. Um, so AEMT, EMTB, the risk potential. And when you're 220 miles away and a fog bank's on the beach um, and even SAR aircraft aren't flying, that's not, I don't want to be hanging out with an EMT. I'm sorry. Well, and for the guys who, who may not understand that in the proper context, if, if you are a, a nationally registered uh, paramedic with a bachelor's degree in emergency medical care and five years in a busy system. Let's give you all those attributes. The volume of information you have to learn about exam findings, pathophysiology, the nature of bacteria, the antibiotics, glucocorticoid administration, testing urine, what all those things mean would still be like drinking from a fire hose, even if you had that level of um, certifications and experience because you're venturing, you're having to maintain all that emergency, but you're venturing into a realm that you have not yet been into if you haven't specifically worked primary care, 
or uh, urgent care. And, and I mean, the ED can give you some of that, but you know, you have to understand that we're talking about understanding these mechanisms of all of these things up until the point that the buck stops with you. They will go from well to sick to well under your care with your the collective time you spend speaking with a physician might be a minute and 30 seconds. You're expected to be able to outline it all. Um, so as an EMT, there's just no way to OJT that, just so everybody can understand a, a little bit better from an educational standpoint. Yeah, and this isn't being like a paramedic elitist, right? It, it's just the risk potential is too high in these areas. It's solely because of the remote nature of it that the the emergency medicine has to be the easy part. Uh, the public yeah. health, the primary care, the critical care medicine that we may have to perform, um, those are the hard parts, and the EMT level is just not educated or equipped enough. They don't, and, and yeah. at that at that level, you don't have an understanding of you, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah, in, in a single helicopter ride, to put this in context that's good for shock factor, in a single helicopter ride, you go from stabilizing an impaled object with a bulky dressing to cutting it out after doing a nerve block. Just let that let that marinate. You know what no, I mean? Not, not just a nerve block, a regional <laughs> nerve block where you're blocking the whole hand or uh, yeah. you know, a radial nerve block or something like that where you're you know, you're knocking out a thumb and in the first finger and a half, yeah. um, you know, and, and under because you have to have the understanding of where that nerve is and what it innervates. You know, if say it's a middle finger that you want to block using a re regional block and you just do a radial nerve block. Well, congratulations. You only controlled half their pain. <laughs> You know, yeah, that, you're going to have that, to know how, how those capsules run with a nerve, a vein, and an artery, mm -hmm. how to elicit paresthesia and keep the pivucane out of an artery or a vein, and and these are just not things you can pick up in a, you know, six- or eight-week EMT course, so we're, we're not going poopy pants on EMTs. It's There's yeah. a lot of education far beyond what any regional community college is giving you. And even with a with a doc who is a fellow in anesthesia who can help talk us and guide us through this stuff, you still have to have the basic understanding because, you know, a regional block, if, if you don't have any education, would to talk somebody through that would probably take a full day of just you know, instilled this stuff. You're still the patient's probably still going to get an infection. You're probably going to have bleeding. <laughs> You're going to kill a nerve. Um, because yeah, I couldn't imagine it, trying to be talked through that on speakerphone without yeah, hands-on you know. training and experience. Yeah. That would just if you want you want to talk about being able to make diamonds out of charcoal for anybody who gets that reference. Yes. What all else right, you so, got? All right. Who wants to go first? We'll. we'll uh, We'll tag team. So, uh, Shay Tree, why don't uh, you got some questions that people asked you? Yeah, I had one that really sticks out to me today. I had a, a, a guy from South Africa was that, and I and guys, I, I use guy as an androgynous term just so you guys understand. It, it's that that's like dude to me. So I don't want anybody to get angry about that. But um, yeah. uh, they are fully credentialed in South Africa. And we're wondering if this was an industry that they could make their way into with the education and experience that they have, assuming it met the requisites. So is there, uh, and this is really a um, remote medic centric question because he's the wizard and all those things. Is that something that a person can get into with foreign certifications if everything's up to snuff? Is there any sort of bridge between the two? How does it work? So um, there, there certainly, and I've seen this work both ways, and um, Access is going to know who I'm specifically talking about here. Um, it, Americans can absolutely use their current existing U.S. license and be licensed in other nations. Um, we've got a guy who's li who has his HCPC, who's licensed in the United Kingdom. Uh, I know an American paramedic who's licensed in Australia, Malta. Uh, the weird Antarctic permit. Um, so 
there's certainly ways to practice internationally. Um, there's a few caveats here. Um, for Americans going to the rest of the world on a vessel, super easy. Um, because you're act once you leave the U.S., you're just acting under the authority of the captain. Um, and all of the, the vessel registration countries will reckon, so typically Liberia, Marshall Islands, Panama, they legally recognize American paramedics. Um, kind of chart blanche, right? So no matter, and when you're on that vessel and that's flying that flag, you're in that country. So, um, you know, we're, we're going to take a vessel to an African country next or later this week. Um, American paramedic from South Alabama, you know, three or four years right out of paramedic school. Um, now, vice versa, we talked a little bit earlier about the U.S. exclusive economic zone. Inside the EEZ, which covers all of the U.S. Gulf of Mexico, um, you have to be licensed in, in the United States. Uh, and it's very difficult for foreign medical training to be approved in the U.S. We see that with physicians all the time, right, where um, they come in. And I know a couple of these guys who uh, very well trained, have done internships and fellowships and, and residencies around the world and highly prestigious uh, global experts who come to the U.S. and they can't get a residency spot, so they can't get a U.S. license. It, it's fairly similar in the offshore world. But what to I will that, say, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was no, just going to say, to that, to that same end, I've had a question that you almost segued into. Can you explain um, for for paramedics working offshore that that do some of these vessel missions, mm -hmm. the the applicability of the TWIC card versus the passport and what is needed, what they need to get ahead of time for that kind of thing. Yeah, so to, to I, I kind of went in circles around the South Africa question. Um, South Africa, the African continent has a lot of oil and gas, um, and South Africa is has probably the most developed healthcare system in Africa. Um, well, there, there's two separate healthcare systems, and, and one is terrible, and we won't go into the politics behind why, um, it, in the travesty that happened over decades that created that. Uh, but there, in South Africa, there's certainly opportunities um, in certain healthcare systems to, to have some of the greatest healthcare in the world. And it's recognized in, continentally um, where the vast majority of offshore medics and physicians in, in Africa are from South Africa. Uh, and, and the vast majority of those are employed uh, by a group called International SOS, uh, which is a global offshore medical provider, uh, corporate healthcare provider um, that that are wonderful uh, that I've I've worked with heavily for many years. Um, so for to directly answer that, there's certainly opportunities. You don't even have to come to the U.S. You can stay in South Africa. Um, they're based in Johannesburg, and there's some other uh, local offices all around Africa. Now for for the international stuff, um, the big things: passport, absolutely. Um, the only reason that you guys aren't required to have a passport is because your locations touch either a touch the bottom the the federal government owns the seabed they don't own the water past the 15 mile limit but they own the seabed out to 300 miles huh. so if you're touch so if you're touching the bottom you're in the US yep uh, which is which is why Bessie will come out and do things like that now uh if so on Access's vessel, they don't always touch the bottom because they drill, they move, they drill, they move. Uh, so there's, but they know number one where that vessel is. They know that it it stayed in that one spot. Uh, Customs watches them heavily. They screen every passenger going in and out. They all get ran through NCIC. And if you don't believe me, go hang out at the heliport and you'll see U.S. Marshals hanging out in the parking lot waiting for somebody to land. 
you know, so now when you get into vessels that are le departing the U.S. to go somewhere else, passport's going to be required all the time, 100% of the time. Uh, and then there's some other, you know, there's going to be vaccine requirements depending on where you're going. Uh, this trip to Africa, the medic had to have yellow fever vaccine. Uh, which isn't one that we can like send you down to Walmart to get, right? Uh, they're, 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 and and you can't get it last minute either because you have to have you have to have time to to develop resistance uh, based on the vac vaccination. So, but you know it's a three hundred dollar vaccine that not everybody's going to be able to get from their doctor. So these are medics that the specifically the international guys. Uh, when we're paying for passports, we're paying for other credentials, we're paying for these high-level vaccines, uh, we're paying for malaria treatments. Um, you know, we're fairly selective on those guys, right? We want to make sure that they're going to do well and they're going to be smart when they're in Norway or Nigeria or Tabasco, Mexico, right? <laughs> you know, they, Good memory. They don't... <laughs> they don't build, yeah, they don't build ports in like the nice fancy areas, right? They're especially internationally, they're typically in dump, dump type areas. Uh, so, but yeah, passports almost critical. The the U.S. It's astonishing how few people, few Americans have passports compared to the rest of the globe. Um, we will reimburse for any offer paramedic who wants to get a passport. Good to know. Um, I won't. I won't reimburse for anybody to get yellow fever vaccine. Number one, because there's side effects and risks to it, and we only we don't want people to go through that if they don't have to. And I'm just not going to give people malaria treatment just because. <laughs> no chloroquine. Yeah. No, no free chloroquine, man. Come on. <laughs> well, especially with the political optics over the past couple of years, you know, and uh, people on both sides hijacking. Uh, you know, evidence and data <laughs> to, to fit, um, you know, and that witch doctor in Texas with the, the Satan. Um, yeah, I can't say that word. It, 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 don't knock it till you try yeah. it. Yeah. I can't even uh, say that with straight face. <laughs> the, you know, the, the, the witch doctor who said that the, the big C disease process was from um sleeping with demons in your dreams right oh my um God. handing out chloroquine hey, you know what I, ayahuasca may may be the cure we've all waited you know so long I'll, for so you just I'll give a shot man um <laughs> the, the other big the other big travel credential um is a medical fitness certificate and um it's not really even a travel certificate it's in our policy that our guys have it you know, and and we just if if you're going to be out there as the only healthcare provider again up to you know middle of the Atlantic Ocean away, we want to make sure you're healthy so that you're not kicking the bucket and, and all you got there is some rigor to take care of you. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. you know, all right, so, so... Oh, things sorry. like things like controlling your diabetes, um, controlling hypertension, if you're insulin dependent. Um, even even as a type type two diabetic, we're gonna be very cautious because you're by yourself. There's nobody to give you D50. There's nobody to counsel you on how much um, insulin to take or you know treat DKA or HHNS if you get to that point. So um, you got to be fairly healthy. And then the, the last big one is uh, a Siemens document which are rather hard to come across. Um, we found some ways to get them. And what that is, is um, it's the International Maritime Organization kind of pulled together all these countries that, hey, seafarers, it's really difficult to get visas to get into other countries. And these ships are coming all over the place. Let's just come to an agreement that we let seafarers go through. Um, so first you got to get a passport, then you can get a Siemens book. Um, and, and basically that says you're part of a maritime crew, you automatically get transit visas, you get crew visas, uh, and it'll help you get, um, seamen flights too, which are a little cheaper, um, because of the same conventions. 
Okay. Uh, let's see. We got another question. Um, I know Paradude's uh, answered it pretty good. Uh, but for our viewers that cannot see the conversation, uh, how many years post medic school would you recommend prior to looking into offshore and travel contracts? So travel contracts, it depends on the contract, right? Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. I was just reading the question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've seen travel, like one of the private EMS companies has this travel contract in the city of New Orleans right now. You can do that day one out of school, right? Uh, you're just going to run 911 call. Um, historically, a lot of the, the travel contracts have been COVID-19 testing. You can do that. Um, you know, we we have EMTs that do COVID-19 testing uh, relatively independently, including diagnostics and coaching and counseling, uh, of course, with physician support. Um, offshore, I typically look for five years, but I'm also going to look up the agency and see, um, you know, is it backwoods? Bayou La Battery, Alabama, you know, pick on them. Um, you know, somewhere like that, you're going to need eight years, probably. Um, you know, Gulfport, Mississippi, which is the highest Medicaid, Medicare uh, subscription in the country, three to five years. Um, and, and a lot of it's individually based, right? Is it the guy who's sleeping while they're at post? Or this guy who's reading research and watching podcasts and, and working on a critical care cert or working on a degree while they're on the truck. Um, you know, so much like certifications, there's not a cookie cutter. But you, you have to, because of everything else you have to learn, you have to know the emergency medicine cold. Um, like the back of your hand, right? So... You should you should probably run hundreds of cardiac arrests. Um, you know you should probably see hundreds, if not thousands, of critical care transfers be between facilities. You, know, you should do tens of thousands of assessments. Uh, you know, truly, I, and I wish we, I wish we tracked paramedic experience this way, but you know. Uh, you're by yourself. There's no backup if if your intubation fails. You should have hundreds of intubations under your belt. Um, you should have thousands of IVs. You should have tens of thousands of neuro assessments. Because you know when you start looking at start learning about you know diagnosing vibrio infections versus staff, um, you you can't. You got to know that stuff cold so that you can focus on all the other things that you got on. Okay. You know, lead, Legionella, right? From a public health standpoint, that's one of the biggest risks we face is Legionella as offshore paramedics. You're not going to learn that on the truck, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, you might, you might see it, but. Paradude wouldn't um, know anything about that, would he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yep. All right, so, uh, all right, remote. Uh, did you have any questions that you wanted to answer from your uh, from your video, or from your Q and A's? I did. Of course, I. Um, yeah, the question is from TikTok from Paramagic. It's education resources you guys recommend for austere medicine. Uh, and definitely the hiring process. So we can we'll talk about resources in a second. Um, and I think I think Shade Tree we we tag team this question because our backgrounds bring different different resources. Uh, my prefer I have two two primary resources for maritime medicine that are maritime medicine specific. I also have all of the books that um, Shatri is going to mention as well and use them heavily. Um, so my favorite resource in maritime medicine is the Norwegian maritime medicine textbook um, developed. Um, we went, we talked about international SOS earlier. They were a huge part in developing that text. Uh, and it's purely focused on maritime medicine. So everything from the regulatory environment 
how ships work, how command structure on ships work, to what is fitness for duty in the maritime environment and how is that different from, say, a chemical plant on land, all the way to treating dental problems. Because um, we we do that too. There's no dentist, so we got to handle. We can fit. We can do temporary fillings, uh, depending on where you're at and what you're doing. Um, you know, so the the Norwegian Maritime Medicine text for me is always my go to when I have a question, and, and it's written at the physician level. The Norwegians have been going to sea since before anybody, uh, and I, I'm proud uh, quarter Norwegian and third generation seafarer um, for that reason, right? And, and I use that text as you know it, it's generations and centuries of of experience is written in that book um and then the second one is the world health organization has a book called medical care for ships at sea it's not written at the paramedic for the healthcare provider the book is actually written for vessels that um, do not have healthcare providers on board which i'm kind of an idiot so um, it, it's a good starting place for me. So like the my first when I first got to the drill ship, I didn't just like shade tree. I get there and they're like, "Hey, you got to go test the water." What? What am I looking for? So I go pull up that book and I start digging through about water hygiene, and it, it it at least gives me the topics that I need to go dig in deeper somewhere else. Um, you know, it, it's kind of for me, it's kind of the Wikipedia. Um, but it, it's evidence based. Um, you know, it's a starting point where I can dive into much deeper uh, evidence based research. And then, Shay Tree, what do you got? So, um, you got your the, stack. Yeah, yeah, I actually, conveniently, I have it right here. So, uh, the Norwegian textbook, um, at the risk of mentioning what you already have, that's fairly new to me. I just wanted to let everybody know that's why I haven't spoken about it before. And um, you can thank uh, you can you can thank you know remote medic for showing that to me because again this is a new world to me. Um, however, I, I I'm always going to recommend this for someone who's just trying to kind of break into the austere medicine realm because that is why this book was written. So it's the U.S. Army Special Forces Medical Handbook, and it is very cut and dry. It it talks about temporary fillings, periapical abscess, tooth extractions when you're in bad bad places, parasites, you know, water hygiene, and a lot, you know, a lot of the things you deal with on land, but it covers leptospirosis and Legionnaire's disease and, and these types of things in, in a very succinct volume. Now, the price you pay for that is that you, you, for one, this is a book written for when you're working on either a civilian population with poor to no medical history or for a soldier who's reasonably in shape. So everything that can go wrong or some of the other pathophysiology we see in people with diabetes or things like that, that that's not existent in this book. So you have to kind of take that in context. But as far as a pocket guide that will help you in the middle of nowhere, it's a great place to start learning about things that you didn't have any idea existed if, if you're just strictly emergency medicine. Um, if you're looking for something a little thicker, because I've got the, the stack here, um, this is a little bit more in depth. So this is the Special Operations Forces Medical Handbook here. Now, this book is really geared towards what a lot of the, the oh, first of all, it's all the branches. So what a lot of the SF does in dealing with the civilian populations, they we do these missions called MEDCAPs, and MEDCAPs are where we'll go out and provide medical care to civilian populations. We'll inoculate civilians. Um, Lots of things, all the way on how to take out a lipoma from, you know, breast tissue and things like that. So it covers all of these different types of things, and it's fairly heavy on the procedural stuff, so sutures and things like that. So in a pinch, when you have to learn about something really fast, these are good references. Um, maritime medicine does carry its own uh, different things, though. So, you know, I don't want to try to speak with authority on the maritime environment because I don't have that authority or experience yet. But in the austere environment where I have operated, I found those to be two 
very useful guides. The one thing that I would really like to point out, and I think every healthcare provider should have access to this at any level, there is a website, it's called uptodate.com, and there are ups, uh, other websites that are similar, but UpToDate has a lot of tools um, in terms of researching and things that are evidence-based that is, it's, it's what the moniker suggests. It's the most current medical information available for treatment of various conditions. And uh, I, I have found it very useful in managing patients' day-to-day -day conditions over 20 years because that is where a lot of that information is contained. And frankly, you know, once you print a book, it's always that book until you update it. Whereas websites and things like that, these programs and these apps, they are able to give us current information that is constantly renewed. So um, while I do love books and I think everybody should have a library uh, and a highlighter, you know, and, and read the words off the page, we do have to embrace the technology aspect of healthcare because it is changing at the rate of technology in many contexts and we are doing a disservice to our patient base if we don't really stay as up to date, you know, as we can. Uh, that's I think that keeps it succinct enough for for this uh, podcast or whatever we're going to call this. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, I've got the audio, so I can make a podcast and a YouTube. I, I'm uh, down. Yeah, <laughs> multitasking. Yeah, yeah, I dig it. <laughs> so, and the, the uh, last one, the last one that I have, is, sorry, access um, is you're good. the community health paramedicine tech. Yes, um, because it, it it does a really good job of filling those gaps in. Uh, like Shaitri, you mentioned uh, uh, a lot of these texts, including the Norwegian text, because of the medical fitness to work for offshore process are, are designed for relatively healthy people who have some sort of problem now where uh, you can use that com community health paramedicine text as a guide uh, for for those less than healthy people who somehow slip through the cracks to help manage them over the long term. Definitely. That's a good point. And it brings up one I'd love to, to get people thinking about just while I have, you know, the moment is while it's good to download all this information in your cortex, you know, in, in, in almost a matrix fashion, you know, if you can, there there is no substitute for assimilating this information into day to day practice and situation by situation. And there there is no field where things are judged on a case by case basis more than medicine. Right. You know, um, the, in the old days, we called it fingerprint medicine because people's individual metabolic processes and everything else, their condition can be as individualistic as a fingerprint. So um, do have this information, um, but recognize it as what it is, which is essentially a cookbook and and download it, you know, into your cortex, but be able in your cortex, but be able to assimilate this information and change it situation by situation, patient by patient, so that you can calculate for all those extenuating factors. And if you can't do that simply by reading a book, don't feel bad. None of us can. It comes with experience. But remember that experience without education is like salt without pepper. It does you no good to have one without the other. And, and frankly, with, with, a, with a decent amount of education beforehand, your experience becomes so much more valuable. And an analogy I use for that is when I'm teaching my, my B to P classes. So I'm taking basics and I'm turning those guys into medics. I, I tell them, if you've seen 10,000 EKGs up to this point, you've seen zero EKGs because you've not been able to interpret them properly with instruction. So those EKGs, while not completely worthless, they're not worth as much as they will be to you at the end of this course. So um, do try to put in, you know, whether it's these books or whatever, Put as much information in your brain as you can because it, it begins to act like a microfilter to get all the chaff out so that you can arrive at, at reasonable diagnoses and things of the like. And I, I just wanted to throw that at the end of that, that conversation. That's awesome. It's kind of hard to follow up with you two guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's why I have the BS to BS. So <laughs> yeah. if I can't dazzle you with fact, I'll baffle you with bullshit. <laughs> Nice. We, uh, the, um, we're both long-winded, sorry. No, I was raised no, Pentecostal. No. I can't help it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the recommendation I have, I mean, I, 
uh, remote sent me the uh, the link for the Norwegian medical book, which was fantastic, especially when I had that downtime. I broke that thing open and started reading into it. But as far as like uh, austere stuff, the recommendation I have, other than those books that were just recommended, would be the uh, the Knowles Wood Wilderness Medicine. Um, it's the Northern Outdoor Leadership School uh, Wilderness Medicine textbook. It's a very good resource. Good one. Treasure Trove, yeah. And that brings up one more that I forgot about. Uh, and they stopped making the physical copy, which I absolutely hate. And I, I was actually going to order physical copies for everybody for Christmas this past year. Um, and they wouldn't do it. Um, they're only e-booking it now. There's a group called the College of Remote and, Aust Remote and Offshore Medicine. It's uh, an actual institution based in Malta, uh, and they're a degree granting institution. Uh, I, we've had internally had two paramedics, one's finished a, a BS there, and one's finished a Master's of Science in, um, nice. mar in maritime medicine there. Um, they make a great uh, pocket guide that's now on apps um, that's in its second or third version. That that's wonderful. Uh, it's great reference uh, for antibiotics and and those things that you don't see every day. Nice. That reminds me of a great one. If I can piggyback on there, um, and it, it's it's what I think. You know, when you finish paramedic school or or even your degree, the first thing you should start with, the first book ever, is the Bates Guide to Physical Examination. Because it will show you so many clinical signs without labs, you know, things like Kernig's triad and SOA sign and, and all those things, um, all the way up through, you know, Trousseau's sign. It will show you so many clinical signs that you can find in sort of the old school country doctor way, if you will, um, which is just incredibly useful in an austere physical environment. It's about that thick, um, but it, there's, there's a plethora of information in there and you if you will take the time to learn that and and these different signs and how to recognize them and then plug that into resources like the textbook of maritime medicine and and be able to understand that your knowledge of, of pathophysiology and recognition of disease processes will just go up exponentially even you will be surprised at what you know um, when you're able to recognize it like that i had to throw that in there Nice. Yeah, I, I saw that in one of your TikTok videos. So uh, it's it's in route. <laughs> it's awesome. Hey man, it's it. You're gonna love it. You're gonna love it. And and for something that can fit in your pocket and hold so much information, it's it's like it's like CIA microfilm quality. You know what I mean? Just that that there's that much information in in something that can fit in your pocket is amazing. So I I think there's one more reference that we have to. In, you know, if there's an elephant in the room, introduce it, right? And that's that's, <laughs> that's peer support. Um, yes, you know, yeah. and even at my level, I rely on peer support. I called I called Chaitry this morning about a case and ran a case by him. Hey, what do you think? Um, you know, and and you can start developing those peer support and peer mentorship. And find a, you know, find an ER doc who's willing to invest some time in you while you're working on the truck and ask those questions. And, hey, man, I got a question about such and such, right? And really, truly uh, be a good mentee uh, and allow those mentors to develop you. That's going to be your biggest resource is, is those, those peers and those mentors that you can reach out to and say, hey, man, and they may not have the answer, they may, but they may have another resource that they can point you to or a friend or a colleague that can exactly. give you that expert advice. Um, it, doesn't all, it doesn't all have to come from a book. It doesn't all have to come from research or papers or, uh, you know, some, some medical journal. Um, you know, so much of what we do, uh, we, we have to be able to share. Uh, and that's how you build positive cultures in medicine. Definitely. And guys, un understand that that shade tree cardiology, while maybe somewhat recent on TikTok, that was born in 2016 from one thing, me being pissed off. I had to pay for educational resources 
when I was a broke paramedic student because none of my military education transferred over to the civilian world. So I literally uh, worked on a farm to pay my tuition in cash because the GI Bill would not cover a certification program. It only covered degree programs. That's ridiculous. I tell you that to tell you this. You have access to what I believe is one of the better tutors on the internet by clicking that Q&A button on TikTok because there, there will be no medical question. There will be no student question that I don't answer on that. If you ask me how I feel about political issues, there's every chance I'll ignore it. But if there's a, a question on how do you interpret this, how do you do that, if you send me an EKG to uh, you know my Gmail and say, can you please do a case study on this, rest assured it's going to happen. Because if you're asking that question, this is my theory, if one person asks that question, 100 other people are asking that question. Potentially, that impacts 100 patients' lives. So if, if this peer review system that Remote Medic is talking about, it extends beyond just the people that you work with. You can count me in on it. Because if you're asking that question out of the however many people it's up to now, 150,000 or whatever on TikTok, there's probably 10% of those people that either have asked or will ask that question. And I will answer it in a public format where we can put that information out there. So please don't forget that. I am an educational resource when it comes to that clinical stuff. And, you know, I joked about it before, but if, if I can't dazzle you with fact, I won't baffle you with bullshit. I won't put anything out there that I would not stand behind and wouldn't want practiced on my family members. So. Just keep that in mind. You know, if you're watching this, if you have a question, and I, I assure you, and I've said this so far tonight, I'll say it again. I currently work with the best paramedics in the world. If I don't know it, I bet you money one of them does. Amen to that. You know, I mean, it, it's just so easy how it, it's it's so comforting how easy it is to reach out and mm -hmm. be like. Yo, what do you think about this? Uh, this is what my treatment was. It's not working. What do you suggest? And you're not going to get, bro, you don't know this answer. It's okay. Well, let's, let's, let's try this. I think you know, people discount how valuable that is, man. They, they really oh, yeah. discount how valuable that is. And, and they, they also don't understand how damaging it is when you're afraid to call a colleague because you think that they'll hang up with you and call somebody else and say, let me tell you what Shade Tree did. Exactly. You know, I don't get those vibes from where we're working now. And I wish everybody else would adopt that model because uh, we're, you know, and, and again, I've been here a very short time, but I can already tell you we're stronger than 99% of the agencies that are on the beach. And that's probably 99% why. Yeah. You know? Yeah. None of us is as smart as all of us. That's takes what's that uh takes a village that's right yeah, yeah. Yep. takes it takes the village to raise a nut right <laughs> yeah. so all right so any other questions we got that was all that was all i had that stuck out to me that was all the ones i had uh there was one more about the hiring process but i, I think at the time we're at um i think we'll yeah. <laughs> I, I think we can do uh you know because hiring process can be another hour two hours um i think yeah. we make i think we make hiring process um i think we give the the viewers a reason to come around for episode two if, if yeah i'd wager these that. questions begin to grow as uh as more people see this because I've, I've seen so much interest in this and i'm really excited to share it with people so i think yeah, it'll grow and, and uh i think i think we've started talking about some really cool cases too um to really that, that some seems of to be the consensus context. That, that definitely seems to be the consensus for what I'm uh, reading in the comments is case studies and stuff like that. And uh, maybe we can sweet talk Dr. G to get on here one time with us and uh, see if we can get, uh, but <clears throat> that, that's for the it, other if you, so it, if you If you know his name and you search his name, uh, he he is one of the frequent podcasts. Okay. Um, so I, I'm sure that as long as we, depending on his schedule and and where he's at um i'm certain he'd be willing to hop on 
Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll work around his schedule. That guy is gangster. We have got to oh, introduce yeah. him to this audience. They they need to meet this guy because everybody be like, I got to go work for him right now. <laughs> Shut up and take my resume. <laughs> oh, and the fun, the cool thing about him is he's semi-retired. He just he does this essentially for fun at this point. Nice. Um, I was gonna say I don't think he's ever gonna retire. He just he strikes me as the kind of guy that's gonna be to the grindstone. Uh, yeah. doing what well, he loves, you know, you know, just not grinding for the sake yeah. of grinding, but doing what he loves. You know, you can tell he's, he's very motivated when you talk to him that he's where he wants to be. I, w- I won't say where, but um, he's got a boat on the West coast uh, that he will just pack up, leave, leave where he lives and go out and sit on the boat for a couple of weeks. Um and and this is what he enjoys doing while he's on his boat is talking to you guys on yours. So. Can I can I tell you a sidebar? So I I'm gonna buy one uh, for the ocean and uh, nobody steal this. I was always it's kind of always been my plan. I was gonna buy a boat and name it Hypertonic Therapy. That's gonna be the name <laughs> on my boat. <laughs> and people are gonna yeah people are gonna sail by and you're gonna go that guy's a certified nerd. So. <laughs> okay, so I always. So this being the first episode, I normally always in my interviews like this, uh, but this isn't an interview. It's going to be a series. I still want to end it because I want to know what y'all's answers are going to be. If you could give one piece of advice, just one, to somebody that wants to get in this field, what would it be? Well, that's a good one. That's tough. My, um, mine would be cliche. Um, but it, it, it would be, uh, stay hungry, you know, it's cliche, but it's, it's stay hungry. And the minute you're not anymore, do something else. If, if you're not hungry for the knowledge, the pathophys, the science, the connection with your fellow man and, and the ability to give them that gift of, you know, I, I care how this turns out. The minute you lose that and you lose the ambition and you lose the drive, um, get out of it. So stay hungry is, you know, I, I that kind of succinctly sums it up. Just stay hungry. I like it. And, and mine, is the, mine is the same advice I give to all paramedics. Um, do things for people, not to people. That's a good one. I like uh, it. I like that. We everything you do should be for somebody, not to them. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's all part of the process. We're paid for what we can recognize, not for what we can do. Too yeah. often, people think scope of practice equates to what I can do with a knife or a needle. Um, and when I think of scope of practice, I think of what can I recognize, what can I see, and say that's what's going wrong in the human body. Or who I can make hungry. Who I can make feel better, whether whether that's you know fix their problem or emotional or you know mm-hmm. when you look at um doing this for people instead of two people you force yourself into that patient-centric mindset uh, that we find so successful it's a good place oh. to be they will pay you money to bring care and aid to the sick and injured i mean if you're okay. if you're built like me it's like hitting the lottery every day and i know that sounds a little norman rockwell but in 20 years, I haven't changed my mind about that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, guys. Well, thanks for sticking with us this long. Um, we will definitely make this a series. So uh, we will sure. keep you updated on when the next video is coming out. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, at Remote Medic on TikTok, at Shade Tree Cardiology at, on TikTok, and uh, at Access Medic on TikTok, I'll put their... Uh, I'll put all of their uh, uh, handles in the description below, along with some email addresses. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on. Definitely. Thank you all so much. Thanks for having us, Access. Later. I appreciate you all.